All right, the Reds, this is the pro view, and we're doing it this time as a podcast and as a video. So if you're watching this on the YouTube channel and thinking, well, what's this all about? Well, it's a, it's a show that we used to do really regularly with Stephen Warnock, with Paul Cope, and with myself, Gareth Roberts. And we talked about, guess what, the view of a professional about certain things in football. Now, the, the, the last ones that we did was a two-parter, which I'd still recommend you go and listen to if you didn't at the time. And uh, Stephen was very honest about his career, about lots of things about his career. And it was over sort of two hours. He uh, got loads and loads of good feedback on that. So if you've only just subscribed to Tour Player on the Anfield app and you haven't had a go with that, look it up. If you're thinking about subscribing, that's another reason to, to have a go. Because honestly, it was really good and it was rare to hear a footballer talk in that depth and with that, that honesty. It wasn't that good. I didn't get invited different. back till now. Well, it's like, <laughs> you've been busy, haven't you? You've been busy. I mean, we'll, we'll get straight into this episode. And this episode is what, what you've been doing since, really. And everyone, there's probably lots of people watching going, this is the fella after tally, isn't it? Because uh, you've been bought BBC, me. Channel <laughs> yeah. 5, Sky, BT. Have I missed any? Match of the day 2, Footy Focus, I Radio like to, 5. I like to just narrow it down to media whore. Okay. okay well, <laughs> it's easier, that. isn't it? I mean, I wasn't going to rip you too much, yeah. you know what I mean? But oh, you ripped yourself. He's just yeah. himself. No, I, See, I, do you like, he's still humble. Still a man of the people. Well, that's, <laughs> that's it, isn't it? Uh, well, I, so how's it all been? I, I was transitioning to normal life after hanging up the boots. It's been good. I've been enjoying it. I, I haven't missed football, which was the, my biggest concern when I retired was, am I going to miss it? Um, am I going to miss the day-to-day -day of playing and go, or training every single day and then going into games? But I haven't. I've found a, a new buzz out of doing the media side of things. I still get to, to go to games, commentate on them and things like that, which is great. And then obviously get the other side of it where you're in doing the analysis of games or you're talking about situations that are happening off the pitch with, with certain clubs and players and yeah, it's it's nice to have an opinion on things and just chat really. So um, yeah, it's been it's been enjoyable. No football whatsoever, not even a, a kick around in the back garden. No, I've only played I played in uh, Petrofi Milner at Celtic yeah. Park, which was great, which was obviously a charity event. I've just agreed to play in a charity event for uh, there's a guy from uh, witness who's just lost his lost his child who's one year old. So there was a, a thing on on Twitter yesterday talking about can anyone raise any money or playing a game and things like that. So a couple of lads who I know are playing in it. So I'm going to play in that on the uh, I think it's the 27th of January. So that's the only games of footy I've I've played. So I've just I've tried to dedicate as much time as I can to transitioning into the media, working as hard as at it as I can because I know it's not a, an easy skill to do and, and then the other time I get I try and spend as much as I, as I can with the family. So absolutely no regrets, I mean I remember when we spoke last time on this you were talking about you were still getting offers and you were still getting clubs saying are you sure we'd give you a contract, we'd give you a go, Yeah. now you're fully out of it and you're doing this you're like yeah made the right decision? Yeah absolutely, um, would I have been saying that if I hadn't have had work? Probably not, uh, I'd have probably wanted it more but I've, because I've been busy and I've been I think the routines help me, whereas I look at my calendar now and it's different in a way because I just used to know I was going in certain days and that was the way it was in the media industry. It's completely different. I'm going to call tomorrow or today to work tomorrow or the day after because mm. someone's dropped out of a job or they haven't planned ahead in a certain way. That's the one thing I've noticed is it's quite short term. Everything that comes up is month to month. So my calendar can look quite quiet and then I think, I've got nothing on that start to panic a bit or I did at the beginning and then I've learned in the short period of time that that is the way the industry is is that you get booked in sort of two weeks before the job and that's the way it is so uh, I've, got, I've got used to that in a way um, still quite frustrating in a way because you want to know where you're at and what you're doing mm. but um, the way I think of it is that if I, if I do a good job then the work will keep coming in and you shouldn't worry about it. If you do your homework and put the work and effort into it, then the work should come. And how have you found that, the, the, the prep that's required to do that? Because I was wondering about this the other day, so I was listening to you on, on Radio 5 when it was third round of the FA yeah. Cup weekend. And, you know, I, was, I still enjoy personally listening to the radio. I know we've got Sky and we've got yeah. the telly and we've got the internet permanently at our fingers, but I think sometimes it's nice to just chill out, put the radio on and listen to it, them going ground to ground and getting yeah, the yeah. news and, and all that sort of stuff. But what got me about that was 
they're coming back to you all the time as, as one of the experts in the studio and saying, oh, so what do you think about X and Y? And so I was thinking that, that must have been a lot of prep to have something to say on all of those different teams, those different yeah. managers, though, you know, and knowing like who's the top scorer or, you know, I think, because I think that the show you did, it was it was if Billy Sharp broke yeah, the record, yeah. didn't he? And so you you were talking about that, for instance. And like, I, I know who he is and I've heard of him and I know he scored goals for lots of clubs, but you, you had quite a bit to say on it, for instance. So yeah. presumably that, that show, for instance, would have required a lot of homework. Yeah, so if I go into a normal show, I'll, this is the thing, I, my, both my kids swim, so when I go swimming and uh, take them swimming during the week, I'm sat there for two, three hours. Now that two, three hours for me, I'll spend like a lot of the time sort of picking my head up watching them. But that two, three hours to me is homework time to do, to, to get me work set up for the week. So like I say, if I know what, what jobs I've got on that week, I'll try and get through my homework when I'm taking the kids swimming. So that the time spent doing the work, prepping ready for a show. Um, I'm fortunate in the fact that I do EFL work for Quest, so I know the leagues, as in the Championship League 1 and League 2, so I get to find out about players. We have an a, a analysis guy who works on the show purely about stats and things like that, so I'm trying to pick his brains all the time or listen to what he's telling me, or listen to what he's telling the room. And I've got two books in my house now that I've just been making where I have stats on people and stats on clubs, so they're quite big books now because every time you do a job you can revert back to it and update mm. it and things like that so for me that's massively important to do my homework on stuff uh, working with certain commentators on shows I did I did work with um, with Five Live and over the summer I did it with Arlo White who does a lot of work with NBC and things and he was the first one who really taught me how to do my homework on teams and players and what I needed so I was doing my homework on them and getting set up and I'd have it all organised um, as to what I wanted to put out and what I was wanting to say. And then I went with another uh, commentator who said, that's not your job. Your job isn't to nail, like to, to reel off stats, if you like, mm. about players. That's my job. Your job is to give input and analysis to what you know. So working with dif different people and different techniques you you pick up what you do need and what you don't need off that commentator try and build a relationship up with them so again that's homework as well so my homework from one commentator to another could be completely different so it's for me it's a massive learning curve at this moment in time that you've got to take every single person differently of, of how mm. they work and it goes the same with presenters on telly as well They'll have their own style of doing things, how they want to do it. Like Colin Murray on Quest is very much, his knowledge is just ridiculous on the EFL and what he knows. And he pretty much likes to tell people about stats and things like that. Whereas I like to give my opinion on what I think has happened in the game and things like that. So it's building a relationship to know when to come in on something and when you can sort of have a debate on things. So it's... Um, yeah, it's, 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 Do you feel like you, you've learnt more about footy now, just in the short period, about sort of the wider football league than you did when you were playing? Uh, possibly, but then I think what's helped me is, is that because I've played in the Championship and I've played in League One, I know what it's about. So I've been to the grounds, I, know, I understand what the grounds are, I understand the mindset of players, what they think, how clubs run behind the scenes and things like that. So I think sometimes when... When I have an opinion on something, mine's, I'm not saying it, it's the right opinion, or it's, but I can be a bit more calculated in the fact that I can draw from experiences of playing in the, in the lower leagues and things like that. So I think it's helped me in that way. But yeah, I think, I think you've, if you don't do your homework, you'll get found out very quick. Uh, there's been times where I've, I've said something and then I've gone, that's not right. And I know as soon as I come out, come out of that show and go onto social media, there's one person who's yeah. there straight away, can't wait to pick up on something yeah. you said. And sometimes as well, when you're on a, on a, on a radio show or when you're on a, on a TV show, you only get maybe 10, 15 seconds to get your point across, but it's not long enough to, to, to give the full extent of what you want to say. Yeah. So you might get the first part of it out, but you, won't, you don't get the reason why you want to back it up with. And suddenly you can be made to look stupid and you think, well, actually, I didn't finish what I wanted to say. And people yeah. are like, but we only heard what you said. 
And again, that's learning from it and trying to make sure that you get the main points out. And you've got the thing which which we found there, uh, especially this week, um, that you know you can you can end up with only a certain part of your being clipped and ending up on the internet, and then people having a certain view of your viewpoint. Then, so you know, for instance, when you're doing five live, they regularly film you, don't they, yeah. as you're talking. And then little bits will be put onto Twitter. I, yeah. I, almost against you don't know that that's happening. Or you don't know what they've clipped until you're out of there, or no, when you get a little break and you look at your Twitter. And, well, but I did say that. But I met, what about that other bit that I said as yeah. well? So, and that's exactly it. Yeah. That's the problem. Is that so? As soon as they clip that little bit, that's that's what everyone sees, but they don't see the bit behind it that yeah. you've backed it up with or talked about. And that's again, that's part and parcel of it. But the only thing you can do is is that you know you're going to get another opportunity to go on the show. And you can revert back to it and say, last time I was on the show, I did talk about that, but the reason I spoke about that was because this happened. Or so you can you can manipulate it in in a way, but they can also manipulate it as well. So you've you've sort of you know you've seen behind the curtain now a, a, a load of the major players, if you like. And is, is there anything that sort of surprised you? Is the the level of professionalism or the, the preparation needed, did, did that surprise you? I mean, we, we were talking just before we started, weren't we, about sort of, you do almost like a full run through, for instance, when you've done Match of the Day 2 and things yeah. like that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what people don't see is, is that you think you just turn up and go on a show and you, you just sit down and you go, right, what are we looking at? Okay, yeah, I'll talk about that and that's it. Right, it doesn't, it do, yeah, <laughs> no, but you, you've got to look at clips and you've got to understand why you're talking about them clips. So there's probably, like it, on, on a normal day, if I go in at, uh, well, when I went in at match of the day, I was in at half 12, midday, to watch the games leading up to it. Then you'll spend a couple of hours after the game putting clips together of what you want to talk about. Then you're in the ed editing suite for a good two hours talking about why you or breaking it down as to why you want to talk about it. And then you're talking to the other pundit who's on the show and the other presenter and the producers and saying, what do you think? And they'll say, why have you done that? And then you give your opinion. So it's great because you might miss something or they might have missed something. But what I found really interesting when I went on there, it was my first time, I was a bit, obviously I'm going to be nervous going on to it, but they are all about, no, you're the expert in football. You're the one who's been on the pitch. You understand it. So your opinion matters and you've got to get that across. So if you think something needs to be in there, you put it in because you're backing it up and there's a reason you want it in there. And that was good to know. Um, it wasn't basically, right, you're getting these clips and you're going to talk about them. It was, what do you want to talk about? Yeah. What did you see happen in that game? Which was great for me. Um, and then obviously you do a, a rehearsal going into the show, which is probably can be anywhere between half an hour to an hour and a half, depending on what the presenter wants as well, and what's in the show as well. So if I do a quest show, our, uh, our rehearsal will be probably the length of the show, because there's so much content has to go into it, and there's so many clips happening. Match of the day, we had three games. In the AFL at the weekend, we'll have, what, 50 or 40 odd games going on. So you're trying to fit all that in, and remember it, and get it organised into the way you want it. It can be... Uh, I come out with a headache after certain shows because you're so concentrated and so focused on it. So how long how long would it take when you're doing something like that? Because if you've got to, if you've got to run through it all and then do it again, because I, th I think things like that is fascinating, aren't they? Because as a viewer, I think you do just think, oh, well, they've just sat down and talk about this stuff, but all yeah. this all the background stuff's dead interesting. Yeah, I'm, like EFL one. I mean, we, we're in. A, I'll be in at tw uh, two o'clock in the afternoon. Watch the live games. There's. We, all, we only watch the championship games at that point and then there's other people in other rooms watching League One and League Two. And we're on sort of uh, forums trying to find out what the fans are thinking about their teams, what the reaction was to the day as well. So there's, there's a lot of work that goes into it. And like I said before, you're never going to get everything right. So you'll always get one person who jumps on something when you, you make a mistake uh, or you don't get something. Um, so often I'll text players after the games who've played in a game. So we had one the other week with Max Power and he got sent off and it, he'd just come back from a, uh, a three-match ban or a four-match ban, come straight back and he got sent off in the game and it wasn't a sending off. So I text him saying, what did your manager say? Um, do you think it was a red yourself? What did the referee say? So when it came to the show that night, I said, I've spoke to Max today and his opinion is he's not gone over the ball, he's gone in fairly. The referee even said to him, after the game, I've made a mistake or something, the club are going to appeal it. 
So suddenly you've give some knowledge into the yeah. show that people can't get. Um, but I mean, that's, that's priceless as well sometimes because people go, oh, that's great, that isn't it? Because you've got a bit of insight into what, what you can actually give to the show. Do you think, do you think it's helped you that what you've done previously? So what I mean by that is, I mean, me and Kofi talk a lot about sort of, you know, careers and career changes and Kofi's writing a book about that. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that always gets said in those type of conversations is skills or, or qualities that you can transfer from one thing to another. Now, obviously, to be a footballer and be a footballer at the very top requires dedication. You know, yeah. you, you can't sort of cut any corners, and if you do, people find out and you won't get there. Yeah. And, and this is similar, isn't it? Because although a lot of people just look at it and go, ah, oh, they're just being paid to, to, to chat about footy, it's so competitive, isn't it? Because, I mean, right yeah. now, you know, it looks like you're doing well and you're getting all these opportunities, but there must be part of your brain that's saying, yeah, and there's lots of other ex-players who are trying to muscle in on this as well. Absolutely, and that's, that's the thing. See, for me, I, I, was an, I was an all right footballer and I, I'm doing okay in the media industry at the moment, but I know if a big-name player comes out he'll more often than not get a job before me in the media because of his name and what he's brought to the game. Now, it doesn't mean that he necessarily can talk about the game because I think I, I can give my opinion and I talk about fo football and I know the game better than I could play it. I've always thought that. I always knew that my head could do more than my legs could do. I knew where I wanted to be on the pitch and what I wanted to do, but my actual execution of it probably wasn't as good as a world-class footballer or a Premier League footballer who's been there for 10, 15 years. But I know I can talk about football. I know I understand it and I know I can give my opinion and I know I can do that quite well. So the thing for me is, is that I know it's going to take me sort of five, five years, 10 years to get to a level where a pundit who comes out of the Premier League and has played for England... 50, 60 times, could be in a year. That might take me five or 10 years. So the commitment level for me has to be even more so. You can't slack off it and think, oh, I'll just get there. There's no chance that that would happen. Uh, I know I've got to work harder than everyone else out there at the moment uh, who's trying to get jobs alongside what I'm trying to get. So that's where my homework comes into it and my prep comes into it that when I get my job, I make sure I do it to the best of my ability. Um, and that's massive for me. That ties into something I wanted to ask, actually, like, because I was thinking in, in any, I was going to say in the world of football, but in any job, we all know there's different levels of effort that people put in, of different yeah. levels of ability. Are you finding, without naming names, obviously, are you, are you finding that it's the same once you've gone into the punditry? Like, that there are people who do just turn up and don't put as much effort in and just, because from a, from a viewing perspective, you can it almost feel that, that like, can't you? Yeah, yeah, you, you watch some people speak and you think, you don't know what you're yeah. talking about. And I'll often find myself thinking, well, you can't have watched all these games. Yeah. So where's your opinion coming from? It's not a great opinion. And then other people come across really knowledgeable. Like yeah. they it's do it's they one of the things that we, like, you know, I've run a fanzine before, I've done the Anfield app, and one of the things that we always used to criticise certain journalists about was the, was the fact that certainly the way it used to work, you used to have your best writer, your chief football writer, yeah. if you like, and they would go to the biggest game every weekend, yeah. not watch Liverpool every week. And so my argument would always be that, well, I know more about Liverpool than you do, because if you're, if you're going hopping around the grounds each yeah, week, you, you just know enough to cover that game, but you haven't watched Liverpool week in, week out. You're not obsessing over Liverpool yeah. like we do. So it feels like we know more than you. Whereas, and, and I think, you, you know, with the internet now as well, as, you, as you've already sort of hinted at, yeah. you've, you've got that instant feedback thing as well, haven't yeah, you? Yeah, of so course, you, yeah. So, so if you're trying to blag it, you get found out, don't you? Yeah, the only thing I would say is, is that, it goes back to my point about, I know I can get across my point of what I want to say. Some people, it can take them two minutes to get to the point that they want to get to, whereas I think I'm, like, because I've done training now in, in the media side of it, it's like I, I try and get to my point as quick as I can of what I want to get across, whereas some people find that difficult to get to. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just approaches and personalities of people. I think there is people that might not do as much homework. I don't know. I've been lucky in the fact that a lot of the people I've worked with, I've learned so much off them because of the effort that they put in and the, de the dedication they put in. I even get, I've, I do like um, a thing for Sky now where we do the touchpad and we move it around and do the tactics and things like that. And Danny Higginbottom does the actual, he does the show on Sky and I'm his understudy to it. But he rang me straight or texted me straight away. Do you need any help? 
any help I can give you on that because he, it reflects on him as well that we all look good on the same thing, mm. doing the same thing. He doesn't see me as a threat because he backs himself to be as good as he can be. Yeah. So that's, in a way, that was brilliant for me and I thought, well, that's, a, that's class mm. for someone to do that. I've had Cara ring me when I've done like uh, bits of Sky, sort of prepping me. As, like I think it was my first one at Sky when I did um, Leeds versus Derby at the beginning of the season, or Derby Leeds the other way around. And he rang me straight away. Make sure you get your points across, what you want to get across. Tell the presenter what to ask you, because that's what he's there to do. He's there to get your opinion out of you, of what you want to get across. And straight away, they're little key things that you get and advice that is priceless, but it sets you up in the, in the long run. If you forget that and just toss it off and go, oh, I'll be all right, I'll be fine. No, they're in it for a reason. They've, they're at the top of the game for a reason as well, and they understand it. But he, like I have, he'll have had to have got that advice from someone else as well. It, it won't, I mean, sometimes it does naturally come to you, and you, you work things out as you go along, but there's bits of advice that he'll have picked up that he's passing on as well. Um, so... But going back to the point of homework and things like that, I think if you don't do it, you, you will get found out eventually. I think another criticism, sort of from from a fan's perspective as well, of, of some ex-players when they're doing punditry, is that is, is a bit of a feeling that some players almost hold something back a little bit, like the the old boys network thing, if you like. So like if if someone's clearly being over the top on, on a tackle or the yeah. behaviour's out of order. Almost, they don't call it sometimes because they wouldn't want to upset the, the mate. Yeah. Um, how difficult is that? Because there must be an aspect of that. I mean, you, you've just literally said that, you know, Max Power, you're able to just text and say, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, what happened there, mate? So, so, but if he did something and you were doing that game and it, it was mad and you had to really criticise him and get stuck in, the, there is a world where it may be easy season. Yeah, goes, but well, what are you on about this, Steve? Yeah, but I, I put myself in, in their shoes at that point and yeah. just think, if, if I heard what they were saying about me, is he fair? Is he being fair of what he's saying about me? Did I have a shocker today? Yeah, I did. So I can't argue with it. Yeah. If, if you felt there was something wrong, I'd expect a phone call and just say, and I'd say, okay, well, I said it because of this. If you don't feel that's fair, then I'll hold my hands up and say it. Um, I like to think I'm quite fair in what I say. Um, I, I do a lot of Liverpool stuff, obviously, because uh, of my connections with the club. I've done it for Five Live, and it's difficult because I've still got mates at the club who play, um, and they make errors. Like James Milner, he's like a very good friend of mine, made an error the other night against Wolves, and I'm on the radio, and I, he made an error. He knows it, so he can't yeah. ring me and go, why are you saying I made an error? Well, everyone watched it on telly. So you can't yeah. hide from it. So that's, that's, the, that's the be all and end all of it really, is that if everyone can see it and you're just saying what's actually happened, then they can't argue with you. So that's where, that's where I look at it from, um, is just try and be as honest as you can because at the end of the day, that's what we're there to do, is to give our opinion. Okay, we'll do what we always do on the ProView and bring it round to, to Liverpool now in the present and where they are and, and get your views on some of that. Uh, Liverpool obviously went out of the FA Cup to Wolves, um, you know, nine changes and three teenagers and all the rest of it in the side, but nevertheless led to some criticism, which you'd expect. What I wanted to get you on, though, was I noticed that a lot of people are now talking about the idea that Liverpool will get a break in January and in February when a lot of the other teams will be playing. Obviously City and Spurs in four competitions, Liverpool now only in two. Um, they played 36, sorry, 10 games in 36 days, Liverpool over Christmas. Now all of a sudden that will ease off massively. And so you get to hear that people are saying, well, this gives Klopp more of an opportunity now to, to get them on the pitches at Melwood, work with them, all that type of stuff. We were talking about this earlier when we said we were going to have this discussion and we were saying, well, how much does that matter though? Because if you're a professional footballer, been playing all these years, and that, that squad now that Klopp's got, he's, he's been working with a lot of them for a long time, so they'll know his ways and things like that. Yeah. Is it that important that he gets them on the pitch at Melwood? Or is it better when it's thick and fast and it's every three days you're out there actually playing a match? It, I think when you're winning, it's ideal to have the games coming thick and fast because you're in a rhythm of what you're doing and it's working and every time you're getting results. When you lose a couple of games, you need to get the, the eye. I think if you're losing sort of three or four on the bounce, then you need to get on the back on the training pitch and, and sort of put it right because something's not quite right and you need to get it back into people's heads what's gone wrong. But 
I look at the, the City game and you go, there wasn't, on, there wasn't much wrong there. I think you just come up against a very, yeah. very good team and you hold your hands up and say, and I think he did. I think he said, listen, we had chances, they cleave three or four off the line and whatever. Um, so I, I don't think there'd be a massive concern. Wolves changed the team, the fluidity, the way that the team gelled didn't quite work. Again, Wolves are a good team, so to chuck out your second 11 against a very good Wolves team um, was always going to be a big ask. So I don't think he'd be necessarily worried by it. I think from looking from the outside in and seeing the way he's worked over the time he's been in charge at Liverpool, I think the one thing he is, he's took on board massively and understood is this, this league is more ferocious than the German league and the games come thicker and faster and that he has to rest team, rest players or give them time off. I'd fully expect him to give the players time off now to mentally get away from the training ground because it is a slog going. Mm. Like people think, oh, you, you've got the best job in the world, you go into train every day, you get paid to, to run around and things like that. It's draining. Mentally, it's draining. Listening to being in the group, group in the change room with a group of lads every single day, the, you know them better than your partners, your wives, your kids, because you're there constantly with them, you live with them. But hearing the same voice all the time, sometimes a break's as good as anything just to get out of the environment, recharge your batteries mentally as well as physically, and then come back in fresh, ready to go again. And I think that's what you'll probably do because I think there's a period now coming up where Obviously, it's an important period, but I thought against Man City, they looked a little bit tired. Mm. Uh, but what, what would you expect after the amount of games? Like you said, not 10 games in 36 days, you're bound to look tired, aren't you? So I think there'll be a, a bit of a rest period, and I think that's as, as important as getting the players on the pitch. Do you know what you say about it being a slog? Is that especially true at this time of year? Because some, something we obviously love talking to you about is the thing that we love talking about separately about footballers are humans and people love to forget that yeah. as soon as you put a certain figure on how much people get paid or the job they do then oh well, they're not a human being anymore yeah. and something I've often said in the past that I always reference Stephen Gerrard for this for some reason doesn't matter whether you're Stephen Gerrard or not when you look out the window on a cold horrible like Wednesday morning and you think it's hailstones and yeah. I've got to go and run outside I don't care how much money's going in your bank account you, you still look and think I don't want to go. I don't want to go out on this. And does yeah. does it get to a point in a in a season where this where you just feel a bit like God? This is this is graph because of the conditions as well. I'd, I'd say so. I think there there is points in it where you do think like I'm I'm knackered. I'm cold. I'm I'm like I could do. It. Sometimes you do think I need a couple of days just to recharge, to get away, and just to have a break from going in. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed training in the bad weather but there was days where I didn't but there's days where it's roasting outside and you're thinking I could do without running around in that heat again today but yeah. that's just that's just anyone being picky about the situation they're in at the time I think when you when you you talk about it being a slog it is a slog to a certain degree because you've got everyone around you all your family and friends who are going out drinking time off with the family going here there and everywhere and your day-to-day -day is to do what you do. And again, people will say, well, you get paid a fortune to do that. But you're a normal person. You want them things in your life. They're the things that I've valued more than anything since I've come out of football, is the time with the kids. If they, if they want to go somewhere, I don't work that day. We go somewhere and we do something. Um, if I need a day off because I'm knackered, I take a day off. And it's, that, for me, is just priceless. Did you fill your boots uh, at Christmas as well? Uh, I went to a few Christmas parties, yeah, <laughs> great, yeah. Uh, but do you know what, I actually didn't, I just, the big thing for me over Christmas was I wanted, I took the 23rd, 24th and Christmas day off, I was working Boxing Day on the 27th, uh, I worked New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, I'm not a massive drinker anyway, but for me it was, Christmas Eve's a big thing and like with my family, my wife's family where take the kids to the panto, go out for a meal that night, relax, enjoy it, look forward to Christmas Day. Christmas Day's at home with all the family, having a nice meal, presents, whatever, like everyone else's is. But it was not having to watch the clock thinking, I've got to be somewhere. I need to be in a hotel tonight or I've got to go to train and hurry up kids and open your presents, I've got to go. I've got to get out the door. It was just that pressure off of doing that. And that to me was nice. 
listen, I'd change it in a heartbeat to go and play play in the, in the first team somewhere again, probably would, but they're little things that you can appreciate. That's interesting, isn't it, Joe? Again, on the human level, you've basically gone from being, and I've never really thought of it like this before, footballers, for all the money and for all the fame and the great job, you're an employee, whereas you're self-employed now. Yeah. So when you said then, I can exactly. give myself a day off if I'm yeah, tired, yeah. you can't do that as a footballer, can you? No, not If you're at knackered all. as a footballer, the best I would guess is you can go to your boss and say, can I have a day off? Yeah. And you might not do that because you don't have that you, relationship. Or... Well, the thing is as well is the fear is is that you tell him you're tired and he goes, well, he's not playing to the weekend then. Yeah. But really, you just need a little bit of a, a breather for a day and then you're ready to crack on again. I think that's one of the, the hardest jobs of a manager or as a player to have that relationship with, with each other, to know that you're not saying it for a negative reason, you're saying it because it's ultimately you want it to be a positive. Um, but yeah, that's the big thing for me. It was... That was when I came out of football, that was my biggest worry. I spoke to a player uh, who I played with at Leeds a while ago and he had a spell out the game from finishing in May up until October. He didn't have a club and he was still 30, 31 at the time. And he said, I was ringing him and I was still playing. And I said, uh, how are you finding it? He said, I hate it. He said, I can't cope with not being told where to be, what time to be in what tracksuit you have to wear on a Saturday or whether you have to wear a suit, what to eat and things like that. He said, can't cope with it. Lo so we love the routine of that? Well, no, he doesn't love it. Just so used to it. Just so used to it. It's like yeah. being in the army. I yeah, always yeah. relate to it like being in the yeah. army. You're so regimented in what you do. Yeah. So that's where now uh, I was really lucky in the fact that as soon as this season finished, we had the World Cup and the BBC gave me work to do on COCOMs. So I was doing homework for it. So I knew I had something. It was like training. So I was doing my homework, getting ready for the big game, go in, do the work, on, do the co-commentating. And it was great, I got a buzz from it. And then there was a period of about three weeks after it where I thought, what am I going to do here? It was pulling my hair out, my missus was looking at me going, you need to get out and do something, don't you? So I started going to the gym, just trying to go in in the morning, get busy and have a routine again. And then once the work started up, I found I had a, a purpose then to do something. And that was, that was where... You're trying to fill that. Well, it's not the what's the right word for it. You're trying to fill that void of not going into training every day, but having something. But my my days are flipped on the head now. Where I used to go in the morning to train, and where my days in the evening now. So I'll have all day off, and I'll either go in and do a radio show at night or a co-commentary at night. But the weekends are still the same because you're still going in for for work and the day to to cover a game. So is your missus made up, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? She is. She's one of them, though, where she, she's just like, she knows how hard I've got to work for it. And she's like very supportive of it and understands it. Um, but she's also in the fact that on mind of, you've retired. Like the kids want to see you. I want to see you. We want time with you. But then there'll be days when I'm in the house and she's like, get out. <laughs> she goes to work, you're doing me head in. So you're never going to get the, never going to get right all the time, are you? On, on the sort of, I didn't have this down as a thing, but it just came up as you, as you were talking then and, and what stuff you were both saying. The idea of, so what you're talking about is being in the right mindset to achieve something, yeah. whatever that might be. And it just made me think about some of the criticism levelled at some of the performances from Liverpool against Wolves, particular senior players I'm thinking here. And we did it ourselves on one of the shows we did, was you didn't really get the idea that they were that up for it. There wasn't an intensity from a lot of them, really. And that's not to question the, them being professional, but I'm just wondering about the human aspect again. So this is, without doubt, Liverpool's most realistic chance of winning the title yeah. in 29 years. And every single one of those players knows that. And the manager will be saying the same to them. So because they're now, you would think, pretty well focused on that as the prize, the F, the, the, it's going to be hard to get up for an FA Cup game is what I'm saying. Yeah, there's another side. I, I, I've been asked this the last week or so as well and I was sat thinking about it the other day and the way I looked at it was, so when you come back in pre-season, it's really hard, it's a tough slog, but some managers will do it where it's an easy pre-season and the games, the first five games of the season are your main pre-season because it'll stand you in good stead later on in the season so you're not burning yourself out effectively. So I looked at West Ham. Now West Ham was shocking in the first five games and you wonder how their pre-season was going into it and then suddenly they hit a rich vein of form and they carry on. 
So you look at the first, well, the nine players who went into that team. It's almost like they haven't had a pre -season. They haven't had them games leading into it. Yeah. So they're not fully fit on them games. So they're going to take time to get up to speed. And I think that's what's happened. I think they, as much as you can train, it's not the same, same as match sharpness. So it's very difficult, I think, at the moment to force your way into Klopp's team. Because there's a rotation to a certain degree, but you know pretty much who's going to play, don't you? You've yeah. got your front three nailed on, back four, when fully fit and nailed on, keeper. It's only the midfield three that really rotate as, uh, as much. But if you're rotating the way that midfield rotates, you're going to stay fit because you're going to play two and three, possibly, in and around that, maybe three and five, something like that. So you're not going to lose the level of fitness. Now you look at Sturridge, Origi, when did they last play 90 minutes? When did they last play half an hour or more to really get full fitness in and do that three, four games on the bounce? If you play 45 minutes in the first game and then you don't play for the next three and then in the fifth game you play 45 minutes, you're going to be a, doc you're going to be a pile of shit in the, th in the fifth game. You're going to feel like shit. You're going to feel lethargic, heavy-legged and things like that. And that's what people don't take into account is that I know you, everyone says, oh, your mindset's got to be right, but you will go into that game feeling sluggish. And then as soon as the other team get the momentum and go the other way and they're flying, it gets even harder mentally and physically because you're trying to get your second wind and you're thinking, I can't here. My head's everywhere. I'm trying to find myself within myself, but you're trying to impress as well. And it, it's a very, very hard situation. Are you one then that thinks there's, there should be a better version of what once upon a time was reserved was team football? Yeah, There is, but then you, you piss players off by putting them in the reserves. I've been there, I've played with, uh, with senior players who've struggled to play in reserve team football. There's no atmosphere. There's, I know everyone's saying, but you're doing a job. You may as well just train. It's not as competitive. It's not as, as, as much fun going into the game because the result doesn't matter and the results are what drive players to get the right result because you know it's a table and you know it's, it's a standing in the league of where you are. That's what drives players to do well. So um, it's, it's, it's the hardest thing in football. Um, the only thing you can do is, is rotate more, but then you'll have a knock-on effect on the team then, won't you? Is that will other players be happy and things like that? This is like off, off topic of the main part of the show, but while we're on this then, because Pep mentioned again this week, didn't he, something that Rafa got in a lot, of, a lot of stick for years ago for saying, I think it was while he was our manager actually, and I've got a mate who's a Sheffield United fan who went mad about the suggestion of putting B teams from Premier League teams in the actual mm. league, in the lower leagues. Is, it, what's, is there a feeling of that amongst pros as to whether that's a good or bad idea? You just be little in the other clubs, aren't you? That's yeah, my that's, feeling. That's the view, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I just think it, it's you're, you're always you're not going to get the same following, are you? As or if you put a B team out and they're in the league, there's a, there's every possibility that Liverpool could fill it like twenty, thirty thousand people. But then you're going to take away from watching the lesser teams of football, then so the likes of Tranmere and things like that, local teams in and around the area. Um, it, I understand it works in the Spanish league, but the Spanish leagues aren't as competitive as our leagues. They're, they're sort of Syria, uh, sorry, uh, La Liga de, or whatever it is. What's it called now? I can't even remember. I can't remember what it's called The second one. Yeah but, yeah, but they have B teams within it. But the league's not strong. It's not a great league, whereas our championship is arguably the most competitive league in the world. More competitive than the Premier League because there's more at stake to get out of it. Whereas, and the League One and League Two, the standard of them sh suddenly shot up now because you've got massive teams within them leagues. You've got Sunderland, Portsmouth. You're looking at them teams and you're thinking, how are they in that league? And that's what makes it competitive. So you wouldn't want to take away from that aspect of it. Okay, uh, have we got anything else? Are you going, you're going to ask him about uh, Naby, weren't you? Oh yeah, should we, should we cover that while yeah, we're here? Yeah, let's do it. So the, there's... Obviously, Naby Keita in his form and there's people starting to lose their heads over it now. Yeah. I always think there's, there's got to be something for people to lose their heads over, hasn't there? So, <laughs> yeah. Naby Keita is like the, the recent one now. And my, my view on it is, let's talk this time next year and if he still hasn't settled, you've got a problem. But one of the things that keeps coming up is a language question. Has, it, has he learned the language properly? Is he struggling with the language settling in? And I talked about it on a show this morning. I, I was saying, well, I wonder, 
Because there are players like Sergio Aguero, um, Carlos Tevez apparently didn't speak very good yeah. English and didn't seem to have a problem at all. And I was thinking, well, to play football in a team, how much language do you need? Because there, there are only so many things said on a pitch. But I wanted to ask you about it. What's, have you had an experience of players within a dressing room where you can see that they've struggled to settle because of a language barrier or even a culture barrier and you see that on the pitch? I think that comes down to the, uh, the person. I think if me and you were to go to French lessons or German lessons now, who'd learn quicker out of me and you? No idea. Exactly. So that's the same when you look at Sa uh, Mane or Salah yeah. and Keita. Who's going to learn the quickest to learn the language? It, it, you just don't know. Yeah. So it could take him another six months to learn the language of what he needs to understand certain things. I think when you listen to Klopp talk as well, is that he has a system and an expectancy of how he expects the teams to play within that system. And for me, uh, Fabino was one at the moment who was struggling with that system. And he said, oh, he's not up to speed. He doesn't understand that system. Now, Keita might be the same, where he thinks he's not up to speed in the system. He doesn't understand it. But I'm trying to tell him, but he doesn't understand what I'm telling him. And there might be players on the pitch who are saying to him, no, no, you're out of position or whatever. But he's not understanding it properly as well. So I, th I think the same. I think the tempo of the league, I, I, I always go, to, go back to it as well, is playing for RB Leipzig, and playing for Liverpool is like, it's just one's up here and one's down here. And that's not being disrespectful. And then you look at the German league and the English league competitively, you might move it up to there. But again, it's more competitive. So they're all little things that you have to deal with. When you look at Salah coming in and Mane, Mane had played in Southampton, so you knew his track record of being good in the league. Yeah. Look at Salah. Played at Chelsea, played at Roma, big club mentality. Firmino, Brazilian international, so he's got a big mentality. Keita's a little bit different in that, that he's played for a lesser club, but the expectancy level now is through the roof and it's a big price tag as well. The, the language barrier thing is really interesting, I think, because uh, I, I thought of this earlier and sort of had a little bit of a chuckle to myself because tomorrow night, uh, me and a few lads are going to a, a sports dinner and it's Peter Reid speaking, it's to raise some money for a height and juniors football club. But Peter Reid was boss of Thailand for a year. Yeah, yeah. And like, you know what I mean? Like, I reckon there's people in England who are struggling to understand Peter <laughs> Reid. <Yeah. laughs> I don't know what happened in Thailand. There's got to be a language of football thing going on. Yeah. He was there for a year, like, so. Well, we've started getting comments on some of these videos saying yeah, you need some subtitles, subtitles on. I know. Right. So. You can't win, can you? Can't win. But I mean, what what about for you personally? When when you were playing, was it ever a, a barrier for you, or was the? I guess there's just no rules around it, is there? There would probably be some lads that came in who maybe didn't really speak English, but they were just brilliant and got it. Yeah, and and vice versa. I guess. Yeah, I think there's some players who you always find within the changing room as well is that someone speaks the language that some that the new player speaks. So when they come in, they straight away they they go to that player, yeah. and that's their relationship. So they get a little bit lazy in the fact that I don't have to learn it because he'll just tell me what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. But then when he's taken out the equation and you're in a room with everyone else and you sat there going, I can't understand anything that's going on yeah. around me here. And that becomes difficult. But that's where you need your senior players to step in and say, right, just sit at the table with them and learn. So Roque Santa Cruz, when I was at Blackburn, was unbelievable. Spoke five languages. So I said to him, how do you speak all these languages? And he said, well, when I go to a club, a new club, he said, I'd go, to, um, I'd go to the local restaurant and I'd sit and speak to the waiters all night at the bar and just learn. And he said, every night I'd go, to, go into the, the local restaurant for an hour and learn. And he said, then what I did was I'd put post-it notes all around the house. So he put them on forks, knives, push, pull on the doors yeah. and things like that. And he said, within six months, he said, I could speak the language. And that was his way of learning. But that's a commitment again. Yeah, definitely. So his missus was going ballistic at him because he had all these stickers around the house. Yeah. But suddenly, without her even realising, she could speak the language as well. Yeah. It, it's a commitment thing, isn't it? It's like... It's like Everyth um, everything in, in life is, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah, because uh, well, we're going completely off track now. I'm going to do it anyway. But a, a game when me and Paul have spoke about sort of, you know, 
So, Who's but, Paul? This fella. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's his actual that's name. Real <laughs> but, it, but it's like, you know, it, in his book, in his book, which I've read, it's very good, by the way. Yeah. Look out for it. Um, but he talks in that about sort of the idea when people say, oh, I, I couldn't go and do something else now. Well, why couldn't you? Yeah, because, of course because, you can. because you could if you if you stop looking at social media or you yeah, stop watching yeah. the telly or yeah. you know you know if you devoted yourself to yeah. whatever it is you can go and do something. People else. people don't like change though, do they? Well, that's it. They are. They just the creatures of habit, aren't they? And just love the environment that they're in. Sometimes they're sad and they don't want to get out of it because they think, oh, I'm just happy where I am, but yeah. I'm sad. Um, and that's just the way it is. I think you've got to challenge yourself in life. I think that's the the biggest thing is that you can do. I think that's where. What, what I'm doing now on the media side is like the probably the biggest challenge I've ever had in my life. But I love it. Mm. Um, try and embrace it as much as you can and take it on. If it doesn't work out, I, at least I can hold my hands up and say, "Well, I had a go. Yeah, tried it, and it wasn't. For, it didn't work. I didn't didn't succeed at it." But I think with the with the language thing, I think you've just got to you've got to throw yourself into it as much as you can. Okay, um, that's been the pro view then. Uh, I thought it was a, an, another excellent one. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Being a video and a podcast, as I say, this time around. So let us have your feedback on both platforms. And as I say, if you've never listened to the Anfield app podcast and you're just watching the video, give them a go because uh, they are very good. And that's how we, we started this business in the first place. So the podcasts are decent. They are recorded in a proper studio. And we've got lots of good guests every week. So they're worth a listen. Uh, thanks for coming in today, Steve. Good luck with the uh, burgeoning media career, <laughs> as, I, as I once called it. Uh, that's been the Pro View. Up the ads. <laughs>